Um, as Ian said, I'm Brian Moriarty. Uh, I've been, well, I'll, I'll give an intro about myself in a, uh, in a couple slides, but um, so thanks to Rocket Space for hosting this, and actually those other two topics sound really cool, so I'm going to try and get through this quickly. Uh, if I do talk fast, it's because when I timed my talk yesterday, it was 18 minutes, and they gave me 15 minutes. Uh, so I hope they're not going to buzz me, but uh, yeah, I have too many slides. Um, some of the slides are for reference, and so I'm going to skip through them really fast, and if, you're, if it's too fast for you to take notes, don't worry about it, because the slides will be online. Actually, they are online. Um, so who am I? Uh, I've been programming since 1982. That's an Osborne one. That's the first thing I programmed on with my brother Mike, who's sitting right there, twins. Um, I'm the former lead engineer on the QuickBooks user interface. Uh, right now, I'm the co-founder of a new little startup, and I'm also an independent consultant. Uh, and why am I talking about CoffeeScript? So basically, a few reasons. Uh, I like concise languages, and I've been doing CoffeeScript for about six months, and I've been doing it in a Rails 3.0 app as well as the Rails 3.1 app. So many of you know that CoffeeScript is like the new hotness, uh, but that it's, it's built into Rails 3.1, um, but you have to figure out how to get it into a Rails 3.0 app, so I'll show you how to do that. Oh, yeah, I just told you what I'm going to talk about. Uh, but also, how to install it, um, using it in a pre-Rails 3.1 app. Also, dealing with legacy JavaScript. So that's one question that comes up a lot is, if you have legacy JavaScript uh, in your app, then do you have to, can you mix them? And if you can't, then how do you move it over? Is it a lot of work, et cetera? I'll talk about that. And then, the, and then why Ruby programmers might like CoffeeScript. And a bonus thing, one thing that I like more about CoffeeScript than Ruby. Um, I'm a big Ruby aficionado, uh, and CoffeeScript's pretty cool. Actually, this talk is not, I won't be evangelizing CoffeeScript um, because I like it, but I don't, I'm not like totally in love with it. Um, it'll be more informational and let you decide. So first, what is CoffeeScript? It's a language, it's a programming language. Uh, it compiles to JavaScript, and so um, it runs, in the browser as JavaScript after it's been compiled. White space is significant. Uh, the compiled JavaScript output is pretty printed, and you can call JavaScript libraries from CoffeeScript and vice versa. Um, there's no like CoffeeScript interpreter in the browser at runtime or anything like that. Since it compiles to JavaScript before it ever reaches your browser, it just works that way. Part one, installing it. So there are four steps to installing it. This is the part that I'm going to whip through because it's not actually very interesting to hear about. It's more about reference. You need to install Node, which, by the way, you don't like, you're not like running a Node server on your server or anything like that. This is just about installing CoffeeScript. Uh, install Node Package Manager, install CoffeeScript, and install JS to Coffee. So here are the steps for Node. Um, and the Brew installer was out of date last time I tried it, but I think it might be up to date now. Install Node Package Manager, blah, blah, blah. Install CoffeeScript. Don't forget the dash G because this installs it in uh, globally, so it'll be in your path, which comes into play in the next one. Installing JS to Coffee. This is the JavaScript to CoffeeScript converter, and if you do npm install dash G, JS to Coffee, just like that, it will install a version that was new as of last July. Um, so I tweeted the guy last night. He's in the Philippines, and I said, Hey, could you update? the Node Package Manager with the current version. And so he tweeted me back about 30 minutes ago, and he said, yeah, OK, uh, I'm on my way to work, because he's in the Philippines. So maybe by the time this talk is done, you can just do npm install JS to coffee. But if you do it straight from GitHub, you will get the newest version. Part two, using it in a pre-Rails 3.1 app. So oh yeah, sprinkled with drawings from my daughters and myself. This, is, this one is not mine. <laughs> So um, Barista, this is how, this is, well, I'm sure there are other ways, but this is how I'm using CoffeeScript in a Rails 3.0 application. And the documentation for Barista says, theoretically, you can also use it in a Rails 2.x app, which I guess means they didn't actually test it or something, or maybe they tried it once. Um, so you just put this in your gem file. Uh, Haml, if you're using Haml, it has to go in before Barista. And then if you're on Ruby 1.8, you have to say gem JSON. And then you say gem barista. And then bundle install. This is also not the interesting part. But then, look, you can do CoffeeScript. So 
you put your coffee scripts in app slash coffee scripts and use the dot coffee extension, which is different, by the way. I didn't say dot js dot coffee. Dot coffee is different. Um, in Rails 3.1 with, uh, with sprockets in the asset pipeline, you would do .js .coffee. And in Barista, it's just .coffee. So if you eventually upgrade to 3.1, you've got to rename a bunch of files, but who cares? It's not that hard. Um, the generated JavaScript goes into public slash JavaScript in the right subfolder. If you had put it into a subfolder of app coffee scripts, it'll go into the same fold subfolder there. You, if you're using Haml, you can also put coffee script in line with colon coffee script, which Barista sort of injects into Haml for you. So there are three, well, maybe more, but three deploy options that I know of with Barista. The default one is once you just install it, every time you run your web browser locally, it will recompile whatever has changed, whatever coffee files have changed, and output them. So it's kind of seamless in the development environment. You're just writing coffee script and hitting refresh in the browser and it's there. Um, you can deploy those if you want. Uh, that's what my team has been doing until we recently got set up on the second option. Um, and uh, the second option is you get ignore those generated files. You add the Ruby racer to a gem file, which for those who don't know, the Ruby racer is a gem that gives you access to the, um, to the V8 JavaScript engine. Mm -hmm. So you install, you put that in your gem file and you add rake barista brew to your Capistrano strip, uh, script, and that will then run uh, the compiler on the production server instead of locally on your environment, which is kind of good because then you're getting the same consistent version of the compiler every time you install it. I mean, every time you deploy it. Or you can install the Ruby Razor on production and generate on the fly there, I guess. I'd, ra I'd probably rather do the second one. Dealing with legacy JavaScript. So JS to coffee is pretty good. Uh, you just say JS to coffee, you give it an input file, which is JavaScript, you give it an output name, which is coffee, and it works. Um, does it need a beautifier? Well, no, because coffee script is like Haml or Python, white space is significant, so JS to coffee has to pretty print it in order for the coffee script to actually work. Um, so it looks pretty nice after it's done. And is there a coffee to JS? Well, I said think hard because what is CoffeeScript? It's a language that compiles to JavaScript. So actually, CoffeeScript is coffee to JS. Okay, three second intermission. Beautiful painting. Actually, that's a photo of Lucerne that I, okay, never mind. Uh, part four, why Rubyists might like CoffeeScript. AKA the fun part. I'm gonna take a water break. So CoffeeScript has good stuff from Ruby. It has some good stuff from JavaScript. It has some good stuff from Python. But from reading through the, the documentation, it seems to be most heavily influenced by Ruby. There is a lot in there that Rubyists would like, hence the talk. <laughs> uh, so I'm just gonna dive into these. And what I'm gonna do is just like one slide per topic. And some of them are super small, so I'll just go, go back, uh, go through quickly. So semicolons are just like Ruby. In other words, you don't use them. Um, or you can in the middle of a line if you want. Parentheses are a lot like Ruby. Uh, they're optional. And in this case, the, uh, the implied open parenthesis extends all the way to the end of the expression. Um, they're required if you're not passing any parameters because unlike Ruby, in CoffeeScript, there are no symbols, so you can't just use a symbol when you mean a reference to a function. You have to actually, you know, you do it like you would in JavaScript. So if you're calling a function with no, par no parameters, then you use parentheses. Stabby proc is a lot like Ruby 1.9. Uh, oh, by the way, so, okay, the cartoon. What is that, anybody? It's a stabby croc. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> So the parameters uh, come before the stabby, unlike Ruby 1.9, and this is the way to define a function. There isn't, it's not like an alternative for something else. This is how you define a function in, uh, in CoffeeScript. So here's an example of Fibonacci, and uh, if I can click on it, up at the top, there's the result. I was, uh, well that was actually executing real CoffeeScript there. Um, 
because I'm not using Keynote or PowerPoint. This is using Show Off, written by Scott Chacon of GitHub, and it'll execute CoffeeScript uh, right there in the presentation. So that was pretty cool when I found that. So there's other stuff that you'll see in this example that I haven't talked about yet, but I'll get to it. When you're defining a method, the, uh, the rules about parentheses are kind of the opposite of when you're calling a method, unfortunately. So if there are no parameters to the method, then you don't have to use parentheses in the function definition. Going back, you see this one again? Fib equals parentheses and stabby. And there's no parentheses on this one. I'm defining a method called clear flash, clear flash which takes no parameters. You can put the parentheses if you want. String interpolation, interpolation is just like Ruby. So run this. You had me at allo. Uh, you can do here docs, which also have string interpolation. If you use the double quote version of the here doc, um, so here doc syntax, you can see it here. There's three quotes. So it'll uh, notice where the line feeds are. It's not. It's ignoring the white space to the left, which is nice um, it, because it's uh, because indentation is is significant in CoffeeScript. So this is something that's more like Python and Haml than like Ruby. Ending a block, you do that just with white space. Uh, so white space, as I mentioned, is significant in CoffeeScript. So the end of that if expression is right after the the next line, and result is a method that just ends down here. Uh, default values for arguments, this is just like Ruby. Page equals one. Variables are declared at the first time they're assigned. This is, this is exactly like Ruby, and it's very different from JavaScript. Uh, CoffeeScript has no var statement, so you just assign a variable when you're ready to use it. And um, it compiles to declaring the variable and assigning it. To reference a variable in two methods, you have to assign it a value um, outside. Store and retrieve are both methods here. And um, if you want to access that variable, that cache variable from outside both, you have to assign it outside both. Uh, in fact, the documentation even mentions Ruby. This behavior is effectively identical to Ruby's scope for local variables. Uh, speaking of variables, there are no globals in CoffeeScript. Uh, that was intentional. So all the generated CoffeeScript goes into an anonymous function like that. Your code goes here. And if you want to access something globally, like across files, you have to attach it to window. Uh, so it has a postfix if, just like Ruby. It has unless and postfix unless, just like Ruby. Everything is an expression just like Ruby. Uh, so the last statement of a method is an implied return, just like Ruby. And uh, so it's starting to feel familiar, isn't it? It's starting to feel kind of comfortable. Uh, there's no ternary operator. It doesn't have the question mark colon syntax. But just like Ruby, if then else in a line, or across multiple lines even, is an expression. So you can do something like this. Language equals if server side, then Ruby else CoffeeScript. And that's the equivalent of the ternary question mark colon. And those birds are turns. And there's three of them. So it's a ternary of turns. Thank you, Hank. Uh, so the <laughs> I got one. So the for loop syntax is just like Ruby. For movie in array, do something with it. Ranges are very much like Ruby. Uh, that syntax is exactly the same. Uh, and like Ruby, two dots includes the last element, and three dots does not. And like Ruby, that doesn't make any sense. It seems backwards, but that's the way it is. So um, I say it's a, they're a lot like Ruby because they're not nearly as, as rich and complex as ranges in Ruby. Uh, this just compiles to a big, long array, one, two, three, four, five. At sign property or attribute is just like Ruby. It's a shortcut for this dot property. Then is also just like Ruby if you want to have a one line if then statement. Um, you could also have done this as enter if has key, but this works uh, especially well for if then else. Uh, the existential question mark operator. So this is like Ruby's dot nil. The, you, 
normally in CoffeeScript, the if expression syntax means exactly the same thing that it means in JavaScript. So that means it's not null or undefined or false or empty string or zero or not a number, just like JavaScript. But if you want to say, is this thing neither null nor undefined, like, like the equivalent of .nl, you would, you would put a question mark on the end. You can put multiple assignments into a single statement, similar to Ruby. The only difference is that you put brackets on both sides, or you put brackets on the left side. Um, and the right side, you can swap variables this way. You can call a method that returns multiple values. Um, you can do splat or assignment to assign like all the rest of the values into an array, things like that. All right, uh, the suspense is over. What's the one way CoffeeScript is even better than Ruby? Question mark dot. This is awesome. So uh, it's like Ruby's try syntax or the and and gem, but much nicer, much better syntax than try. So if you call, if you do question mark dot on null or undefined, it doesn't raise a type error, it just returns undefined. So like if I execute this, whoops, execute this expression, it says undefined instead of, instead of raising an error, type of person question mark dot name returns undefined. And on the next slide, this is why it's so awesome. It's great for function chaining. Person is just an empty object. And oldest kid equals person dot kids question mark bracket zero question mark dot name question mark dot first. And that's not going to raise an exception. That's just going to return undefined. So that's pretty sweet. In conclusion, there are lots of other things I didn't mention, even though I talked about a lot. There's an optional YAML-like syntax for literal for object literals. There are splats for variable arguments. Um, there's other cool stuff. And these are the things I use to reference this. By the way, full disclosure, I stole a lot of this info straight from coffeescript.org. I didn't just invent this. Uh, but um, I like the examples and stuff. Coffeescript.org is great. It's got tons of documentation. Here it is. And you can see it's really, really long. And it has this awesome little try CoffeeScript thing where you can type into it, and it compiles it to JavaScript. So that's cool. And js to coffeeorg has a two-way playground, not just one way. So I can type JavaScript, and it'll show you the CoffeeScript, or I can type CoffeeScript, and it'll show you the, 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 uh, the JavaScript. And then Barista. Uh, thank you. The boldface thing in the middle there, bmoriarty.github.com slash coffeescript-talk, that's where these slides are. If you want to go back and reference the stuff about Barista and about how to install CoffeeScript and JS to Coffee and all that stuff, it's right there. Um, and cartoons by me and Rosie and Elizabeth, my daughters. Thank you very much. <laughs>